It's great to be here, and um, uh, it's been quite a nostalgic day for me altogether because I spent uh, many years at the University of York, um, and, I, and I spent some time in New York this afternoon with some old friends, and then um, uh, I moved to Cambridge about 11 years ago to start the Sainsbury Lab there, and I, across that entire period of time, have been uh, an, a Gatsby advisor, and come, I've come very regularly to this summer school since... Ooh. God knows how long, long before it was even based here. And it's always been a joy and a pleasure to meet the, the next generation of plant scientists. So it's great to be here again um, after a two-year break for everybody. But for me, it's been a particularly momentous two years because during that time, I, ha I took this job um, uh, heading up UK Research and Innovation, which is a kind of huge shift in many ways in what I'm now doing with my life compared to what I was doing two or three years ago, so it's nice to be sort of doing this, more nostalgia. Um, and I, why did I do that? For a, for a whole variety of reasons, I was anyway doing a lot of kind of science policy work um, in parallel to my research. And um, it sort of got to the point where I more or less had to decide because I couldn't do both of them as well as I wanted to do. And this opportunity came up, so I took it. And I'll say a little bit at the end about, about how it, <coughs> how I see that, why I made that transition, and how it relates to what, I'm, uh, what I used to do. And I suppose uh, in that context, I wanted to start with a little bit about what kind of got me fired up about plant biology in the first place, right from, from school, way back, a long time ago, when <coughs> um, I was introduced to this person, Gregor Mendel, and um, those peas, uh, which are the very famous round and wrinkled peas. But you can see um, in this pea pod, the three to one ratio happening in real life. Here's the round peas and here's the wrinkled peas. And I was just kind of awestruck really by the way in which you could look at these whole plant phenomena, at traits segregating through generations, and from that, make these extraordinary inferences about what was going on at a molecular level. Now, obviously, Gregor Mendel wasn't really thinking about it in the context of the molecular level. Um, he was thinking about it in the terms of these hereditary particles or factors, as he, he called them. But those, of course, we now know are genes, and they're made of DNA. And the relationship between what's going on in those A's, G's, C's and T's and what's going on in a whole plant that all of that stuff in between that I find utterly um, gripping and the fact that you can infer so much about that process just from looking at those um, whole plant phenomena, how they pass through the generations and uh, the, the, the relationship between those and what the changes at the DNA level have been. That, that is, is the kind of problem that kind of fires me up. And <coughs> that's what I, I kind of mean by this multi-scale emergence. It's a, a load of phenomena going on right across scales in biology, from the nanometer um, scale in the DNA right through up to the whole plant scale. And the interaction of things at all of those scales um, is, is driving the emergence of these huge patterns at the very high level from s tiny changes at the, at the um, micro and nano scale. <coughs> so, um, Gregor Mendel, um, I was introduced to in school, and then the, the sort of next phase was in university, where, where you are now, that two or three uh, things really kind of built on that um, interest, and <coughs> from a whole series of lectures by John Fincham, who um, uh, taught me right across the years, I think, when I was an undergraduate, um, really wonderful man who de dedicated his life to aspergillus genetics. But um, the two things I want to mention that he introduced me to that really also capture this multi-scale thing so well, one of which is the discovery of transposable elements by Barbara McIntock. She won the Nobel Prize for this discovery for medicine, despite the fact she worked her entire life in maize, because the phenomenon that she discovered, these bits of DNA that move about the genome, or so-called jumping genes, um, so transformed biology that the impact has, fe has, has felt right across 
the whole of biology. And the way she did it was absolutely through that same approach that Gregor Mendel used of, lo of looking at whole plant phenomena, and in her case, maize kernels that were speckly on, on the right-hand side there, but also they're very well studied now in, in snapdragons, so those patchy um, snapdragons that you see. Those things are caused by the fact that um, genes involved in the biosynthesis of pigments, either in the flower or in the maize kernel, <coughs> are um, inactivated by a piece of DNA sitting in them, one of these transposable elements, when they jump out, that can restore the, the, the gene <coughs> that is required to make the pigment back to normal. And so you can see you can see the footprint effectively of where the gene has jumped out by that little patch of colour in the kernel. And Barbara McClintock inferred that, which was a totally revolutionary idea, that bits of DNA could hop about the genome, because everyone was thinking of the genome really as very stable, these particles almost of, kind of, 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 of DNA, very stable, very fixed. And the fact that, that bits of DNA hopped around causing these major effects was, was quite a revolution. And that's why she won the Nobel Prize for it. And she did it, as I say, using these phenotypes and relating that down to things she could see down a microscope, um, looking at the chromosomes of maize. And uh, quite often when these genes jumped out, sometimes they restored the the colour back as I've described, but sometimes they did it imperfectly and you actually got a break in the chromosome and you could see that um, down the microscope that you know, the chromosomes had reorganised because they'd um, come apart and then stuck back together again in the wrong way. So she, she put together those observations of chromosomes down the microscope with these high level genetic phenomena and discovered transposable elements. Same set of lectures by same wonderful John Fincham also introduced me to these um, fungal spores, which I just think are extraordinary. So these are um, Sordaria. There are various uh, fungal species where uh, the, the, the way the spores are made, and these are haploid spores, so just one genome, um, that the, the spores in, in a line are the products of the meiosis that has um, created that haploidy. So... Um, what you can see here are little rows of eight spores, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And those represent the products of that one meiosis. And if you think about it, if you go back to your um, knowledge of meiosis, where you start with a diploid organism, <coughs> so two sets of chromosomes, and um, uh, it, the, there's a, a DNA replication, so then you have essentially... Um, uh, four sets of chromosomes, and each chromosome has two DNA strands, and those then go through that series of divisions, you'll remember, and used to give you um, four, and then through a second division, eight uh, spores here, and that means every single one of these spores essentially represents the genotype, or how the DNA was, in one of the strands of the original cell um, when it was dividing, and that... <coughs> um, realization led a whole bunch of really extraordinary geneticists working on this these spores to infer all kinds of quite impressive things about the way meiosis works from just looking at these spore colors and um, where you've got these simple patterns of four and four it's quite easy to work out what's going on sometimes um, you've got um, a flip so that there's two there's two, 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 and two. So yeah, and you can you can think about how the, the the crossover events in the meiosis resolve to give you those different patterns of of, um, of segregation. And beyond that, they also discovered that occasionally, just occasionally, you wound up with not um, the expected ratio, but instead a three to five ratio of coloured to non-coloured spores. And in those circumstances, they started to understand that the way the crossover events worked. Um, involved invasion of DNA strands from one of the chromosomes into the other one and created these um, uh, essentially heteroduplex DNA. I, I, you don't, I'm not trying to, to um, sort of wow you with the detail of meiosis. What I am trying to wow you with is the extraordinary level of molecular detail you can infer just by looking at these buff spores and dark spores um, from, the, from the, uh, the, the outcome of the... Of of genetics. And that I, I found really inspiring going up through um, my undergraduate degree. And in the third year, 
um, I had a particularly extraordinary course on developmental biology that um, ran, I was at Cambridge, and it ran across all the departments. And this is a sort of totally stellar lineup of, of developmental biologists. Um, you might recognise John Gurdon, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his uh, work on frog uh, development. Um, uh, it was essentially a very early animal cloning experiment, um, similar to the kind of Dolly the Sheep experiment you know so well. Um, but uh, on top of that, most of these people are actually Drosophila geneticists. And when I was going through my undergraduate um, degree at that time, that was the, the really a, an extraordinary time in Drosophila genetics where some of the key developmental phenomena were being discovered and understood at a molecular level. Again, using that extraordinary power of, of mutation to understand um, uh, the function of genes normally by destroying that function with, with mutagens and then seeing what happened. And, and most of that work was going on in fruit flies and incredibly powerful. And again, you know, Nobel Prizes being won all over the place. And also in that course, it, it was a cross-departmental course, was our um, very own David Hankey, whom the Gatsby Network know really well because he does these incredibly inspiring um, uh, lectures at the, summer, at the um, network uh, training events for our PhD students on how to give a talk. He's, he's completely inspirational. He does brilliant talks. And he was talking about plant hormones, which were inherently already very exciting from my point of view. <coughs> and he was talking about it, though, primarily um, not using genetics, instead just using physiological approaches in, in tobacco and I thought, well, that's all very well, but what if we had really good genetics for plant hormones? And fortunately for me, just at that time, um, was the very beginning of a complete revolution in plant biology, which is the widespread adoption of this thing, Arabidopsis, as a model system. So um, <coughs> I'm sure anyone who studied any plant biology at all at university level by now can't possibly have not come across Arabidopsis. Um, when I was an undergraduate, most people had never heard of it um, because it really was barely used. There were a very small number of groups pioneering its development. And there was a kind of explosion in the 80s, and I was there just at the right moment to catch that. And <coughs> I decided what I really wanted to do was um, understand some of these key um, developmental biology questions, which is this ultimate multiscale emergent question problem, using uh, Arabidopsis as a model system, using that extraordinary power of genetics. So um, just to, to sort of go back to this development question, uh, <coughs> as I think you probably gathered by now, I'm really interested in how you link this molecular level information to the whole organism level information. And development is the kind of quintessential multiscale uh, uh, problem in biology. Single cell at, at fertilization, um, extraordinary loops of information between the DNA in your genome and the cells that you already have, um, driving forward the production of a really extraordinary patterned organism with many different sorts of cell in different places, doing the right thing at the right time, and then uh, um, at the end, uh, an organism. And if you're an animal, most of that goes on in early in life in embryogenesis, and then after your after birth or whatever it is that you're going through, um, most of the way you deal with environmental information and so on is behavioural. Um, you get bigger, but mostly um, you interact with the world around you by changing your behaviour, and um, that's all very interesting and lovely. And I'm, as I said, my primary interest is was this how you go from the single cell to the complex multicellular organism um, because of its uh, the way it, it really encapsulated that, those kind of multi-scale organisation questions that I was interested in. I, I still like to kind of look at lecture theatres like this and think, you know, all of these people sitting here, you used to be one cell. And, and that, that, I think that's an extraordinary achievement early in your life <laughs> to get to the point where you were no longer one cell, but rather the wonderful people that you <laughs> are today. And since then, you've been um, growing and behaving, and that's all been very good too. If you're a plant, things are even more interesting because, yes, single cell, um, lots of uh, wonderful uh, uh, developmental biology happening to get you to the point where you're a seed. Um, same questions, you know, lots of different cell types now in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. But if you're a plant, masses of post-embryonic development, so the seed germinates, and actually a huge amount of the cool stuff happens 
after that point. So yes, growth, but lots more development. And that development is in many ways conceptually similar to the behaviour of animals because it's through that development that the plants uh, adapt and deal with the world around them. So <coughs> um, why is there this big difference? Why is there behaviour in animals and, and development in plants? That comes down, I think, uh, fundamentally to the fact that the way in which animals and plants um, exist is different. If you're an animal, you're dependent on eating plants, essentially, either directly or indirectly for your existence. And so your job is to go about the place collecting them up. And so mobility is essential. And with mobility uh, comes all kinds of um, interesting challenges, like long, you have to see what's going on way over there. And you have to um, <coughs> um, go and get it and possibly get it in competition with somebody else who wants it. So I mean, you can imagine the, the, the selective forces that drive the kinds of sensory uh, inputs that animals have and their ability to react quickly to those sensory inputs. And that's been channeled through central processing in a brain. If you're a plant, things are rather different. You're not going around the place collecting up concentrated um, food in the form of plants. Your MO for getting um, food is uh, sunlight. That's where your energy is coming from. And you are building yourself literally out of thin air. I mean, this is an absolutely astonishing thing that we just take for granted, that plants grow. <laughs> They're building themselves out of carbon dioxide and water, using light energy to do it, which is, is, is kind of mind-blowing. And it's completely different from what we do, which is just walk along and collect a plant and eat that, which has done this amazing job on our behalf. So um, th this is already amazing. And then beyond that, that shifts deeply and fundamentally the drivers that underpin plant evolution. It's not about seeing things a long way away and going to get them more quickly than the opposition. It's about surface area. It's about can you collect up these um, uh, dilute and but nonetheless available resources from the environment as quickly and effectively as possible. And that requires surface area. So um, if you're a plant, you need this large surface area underground for collecting the water and the mineral nutrients. nutrients. And then uh, you need a large surface area above ground for collecting up the light and the carbon dioxide. And this surface area thing is, uh, is uh, essential, but it creates two directly related enormous problems for plants, uh, which is that they're now rooted to the spot. And as soon as you're rooted to the spot, um, two things happen. The first is, if you're in a, a, a challenging environment that is not very good for you, um, that you can't run away and go to a better one, so you have to just deal. And the second is, you are a sitting duck from a predation point of view. So this is a slug. Um, if I see a slug, I am not terrified that it's going to run and eat me. Uh, it's really a very unthreatening creature. But if you are an allotment grower, you will know that this is a vicious predator. Um, because for plants, th even the th a slug is, is very able just to munch its way through your entire um, resource base, um, no problem. So <coughs> these two problems that emerge from immobility, which is essential for you to correct, collect up the water and mineral nutrients that you need, need a powerful solution. And plant developmental biology uh, can fundamentally be thought of as a solution to those two problems. And the solution um, comes in two forms. The first is that continuous development that I talked about. So uh, <coughs> uh, here's the, that um, seed again that I showed you. And the, a key kind of event in the, the building of this seed is the establishment of, let's see if this works, um, a little group of cells at the, the top end here, which is called the shoot apical marrow stem that forms the entire post embryonic shoot, and a similar little group of cells right at the bottom that forms the post embryonic root. And then the rest of this stuff is really about getting the, the marrow stem up out into the um, air and the root um, down into the ground and these are the seed leaves, the cotyledons that will open up and provide the initial photosynthesis um, kind of um, drive and the initial light capture that the plant needs to get going and then um, um, off you go. 
And so most of the development happens as a result of the action of this and this uh, post-embryonically after germination. And that continuous development allows the plant to grow and develop in a way that is environmentally sensitive so that it can deal with the different environments in which it finds itself. And so this is the, a, the shoot apical merison of a tomato plant in, a, in a, a germinated plant. And it's producing these leaves in this beautiful spiral, uh, which I understand are the basis for an extraordinary workshoppy thing you're going to be doing tomorrow. So um, you'll learn all about how this beautiful spiral happens. But um, suffice it to say that um, the, what this meristem is doing is churning out modules. And this is the second key um, part of the solution that plants have. Um, their growth is fundamentally modular. So um, the, the way that um, works diagrammatically, here's the meristem. It's making um, leaves that I showed you and chunks of stem. And then in the base of every leaf, there's another shoot apical meristem, this axillary meristem here. And um, uh, that module is called the phytoma, axillary meristem, leaf, chunk of stem. And essentially what a meristem, a shoot apical meristem is, is it's a factory that produces those, meris those um, um, phytomas. And in the primary shoot, you can see it like this. And then because every single one of them has the second meristem, an axillary meristem, and these meristems have the same developmental potential as these primary meristems, everyone can make a branch and those branches can go out. And so <coughs> just by churning out those phytomas, you can produce a plant that has a huge ramified bush. Or if these axillary meristems don't activate, you can have a single unbranched shoot. And so what you have now is incredible flexibility of form. So you can uh, grow and adjust according to your environment. And crucially, you have no unique parts because this system is entirely modular. And with no unique parts, if a slug eats all of these branches, it doesn't matter very much because there are all of these other branches. And so that um, solution, modular continuous development, simultaneously addresses both of those challenges from immobility. But it creates a different challenge. Um, <coughs> as I talked about earlier, if you're an animal and you're rushing around looking for all that stuff, the way you're mostly doing that is collecting up information, processing it centrally in your brain and, and acting. If you're a plant, having a brain would be a really stupid idea because that would be a unique part that would be um, uh, if the slug ate it, you'd have had it. So <coughs> this modularity um, also requires that you, um, it solves the, the, the no unique parts problem, but it requires distributed um, information processing and distributed decision making. You have to be able to make those sensible decisions about what to do. Should I grow a branch or not grow a branch, which is the question I've been asking for a large part of my life. Um, and you have to be able to do that with no central processing in a distributed way. And that has been the question that I have sort of settled on in my research career as, as the kind of quintessential type of question I really like. And it's a really important, really useful model system for studying it. It's a really distilled version of that question. And it happens to be incredibly important agriculturally as well. So um, uh, what I've spent a lot of time doing is trying to understand how these buds the, um, which are the product of the axillary meristems between the leaf and the main stem, how they decide whether to activate or not. And they will take in, into account all kinds of information. Obviously, the, the, the genotype of the plant, there's genetic variation in this, the environment in which the plant's growing, the, the internal physiology of the, the plant, which is sort of a, a, um, a, an amalgam of those things in some ways, and, of course, uh, um, the, the developmental state of the plant. And you can see this very powerfully in these two Arabidopsis plants. This one, which has been grown with lots of fertilizer, high nitrogen. This one's been grown on low nitrogen. <coughs> and um, what you can see is that the one on high nitrogen has got a lot more branches. Those branches form in a, in a strict sequence, actually, a basipetal sequence after the, after the Arabidopsis flowers. Arabidopsis makes initially a little flat rosette of leaves, and then when it flowers, the stem, um, it, it sends up, elongates up to make this flowering shoot here. And um, it's after that flowering shoot emerges that the branches start to happen, and they start in a strict top-down sequence, and they stop then at some point in the rosette. And what you can see with the low nitrogen plant, same thing, only it's stopped early. 
so that if you look at this bud here, it's not growing. The equivalent bud in the high nitrogen, nitrogen situation is growing, and indeed some more below that too. Whereas this bud here is growing on the low nitrogen plant and on the high nitrogen plant. So how on earth does this bud here know not to grow when nitrogen is low? That kind of question um, is what I've been trying to address for quite a long time now. The, the kind of take-home message, I suppose, is that this decision is made in this kind of distributed way, as I described, through the action of a series of long-range plant hormones that move up or down the plant, interact with one another in interesting feedback loops, and allow that integrated decision-making that can take into account both local information about how much sun there is around the bud, for example, but also global information, how much nutrient do I have altogether? Those kinds of questions brought together so that each one of these um, meristems can make a decision about whether or not to activate. Now, getting into that question, a really um, uh, obvious input that everybody here knows about who's ever done any gardening is that how happy this primary shoot apex is depends on, uh, influences whether or not these buds underneath activate. And again, you can think about this a little bit in the context of the slug. So um, if a plant's growing happily and everything's fine, then these buds can stay dormant because you've still got a shoot that's making all kinds of leaves and it's lovely. If the slug or a pair of secateurs chops the top off, um, then uh, what you see is that these buds will activate and grow out and this is a phenomenon that's been known about for uh, a century and it's called apical dominance. And for at least that long, it's also been known that if you do this experiment and you apply auxin, um, the, which is an incredibly well-known plant hormone that I hope everybody in the audience will have heard of by now, as an aside, this is my top tip for e exam passing in biology, in plant biology. If you don't know the answer to the question, write auxin because it will almost certainly be at least one mark worth of the answer. So, so that, that's just, that's just my, my tip. <coughs> so I, I used to tell my students that, and, and I did have one student who very sweetly wrote orcs in in response to a question that they didn't know the answer to, and it sadly wasn't right. So I, I just, <laughs> just there, there, there is a risk to writing orcs in, but it's your best answer if you don't know. OK, <coughs> so the auxin applied to the decapitated stump will actually inhibit the activity of these axillary meristems. And it will do that in a rather interesting way because we know that auxin is exported um, in, in, in real plants from young expanding leaves. So the shoot apex that's an active shoot apex is a major source um, for auxin. It's transported down the plant and that stream of auxin, the so-called polar transport stream, is a fantastic information source. It says, I'm a happy apex and I'm exporting auxin. And, <coughs> and that auxin does a lot of things in the plant um, in the context of it being a, essentially a signal for a healthy um, shoot apex. And that basipetal transport is a, a crucial part of that, transmitting that signal. And that um, happens the um, activity of some really astonishing proteins um, that are called um, pins. They're called pins because um, the, if you don't have this particular one, pin one in Arabidopsis, you, you are very poor at making flowers and leaves. And um, so you make a stem with no flowers, essentially, and that looks like a pin. So that's the name of that. Um, the name of the gene was named after the what the mutant looked like, so the genes are called pins. And I, you'll be, um, I think, hearing a bit more about those also in the context of, of um, making uh, leaves at the shoot apical meristem. But in this context, what they're doing is transporting the auxin down the stem. Pins are auxin efflux carriers. And you can see here, when they're labelled with GFP, that they are um, positioned specifically at the bottom ends of cells in the xylem parenchyma in the stem. So the auxin is being transported downwards because of this basal positioning of the pins. And <coughs> somehow or other, this auxin moving downwards um, because of these pins in the stem is able to inhibit the activity of these buds. Um, we know it does that um, because of the kinds of experiments I've described to you already where apical application of auxin keeps these buds off. We know it does it indirectly because if you use radio labelled auxin in those kinds of experiments, go straight down the stem, inhibits the activity of these buds, no radio label is in the bud. So how do they do that? They do that um, in a, in a, in a, in a number 
number of different ways, but the way I want to talk to you about, because I think it's the way that really anchors this integrated decision making um, in, 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 a, in the context of allowing the plant to make decisions um, in that distributed processing way that I've talked about. The way they do that comes from the, the extraordinary behaviour of these pin proteins, which seem to be able to respond um, not only to the concentration of auxin, but also their, their activity, the flux of auxin, the movement of auxin. And the regulation of, these, of the accumulation of pin proteins by flux, we don't know how it works. It's deeply mysterious. You can solve that because you're You've got time, <laughs> um, but it is, uh, there's a huge amount of evidence for flux-correlated allocation of pin proteins to membranes that underpins an awful lot of quite complex behaviours that I want to um, just describe um, quite quickly now. So this idea of the way pin proteins behave is called the auxin transport canalisation hypothesis that was introduced by Tzvi Sachs in the 70s and 80s. And it's based on the idea that auxin both upregulates and polarizes its own transport. And you can see this effect. So the original Sachs experiments were carried out in the context of watching plants heal themselves um, in response to wounds, and particularly watching their vasculature heal itself in response to wound. So if you've got a, a bean stem like this and you stick a razor blade in it, um, which is what this is here, um, what you see is that... Um, but at the time when you start the experiment, there are these pin proteins here labelled red at the bottom ends of cells in the stem. Um, you stick the razor blade in, the auxin's coming down the stem and it starts to accumulate here. And so over time, there's auxin accumulating here. Meanwhile, it's being carried away below the cut here. So now you have a strong source of auxin here and a strong sink for auxin here. And there's a trickle of auxin that moves passively from this strong source round to the sink. And that um, passive movement of auxin from the source to the sink um, upregulates and polarizes pin proteins in the direction of that movement, of that trickle, of that um, flux. And you can see that because now, when you look here, instead of these nicely downwardly polarised pins, there are sidewards, laterally polarised pins that have reoriented um, in response to the change in auxin and auxin movement that has occurred by sticking this razor blade in. And if you wait long enough, you wind up with files of cells that connect up between the previous files that were nice and organised and downward transporting and the files underneath that were nice and organised and downward transporting. And those um, files of cells with polarised pin um, then uh, accumulate auxin and can differentiate into vascular strands healing the, the cut. So that was the, the, the type of experiment that led Sachs to think that this canalisation process happened, hooray, and we thought that this might actually be the same way that indirectly auxin moving in the main stem might be able to inhibit the activity of axillary buds. And that was based on this very famous Sachs experiment where he had an ex a pea stem again and he put a cut in it here um, on the side this time and then applied an auxin source here. And what he found was if you go away and come back a week later or two weeks later, there's now vascular strands differentiated correcting this, connecting this auxin source that you've put here to the existing vasculature. And that's because when you started the experiment, this existing vasculature is a great sink for auxin. So then you've got your source and your sink and you go through that positive feedback canalisation process I described transport the auxin from the source to the sink, create those files of pin-expressing cells which then differentiate, differentiate into vascular strands. Um, if you do the same thing, but now you've added auxin also to the existing vascular strands, either when you add this lateral source, nothing happens at all, or sometimes you get some vascular differentiation, but it wanders around and it no longer connects to this existing vascular strand. And that, we can hypothesise, is because this is no longer a very good sink for auxin because it's already got plenty of auxin um, being supplied directly to it from here. So now, whilst there's an auxin source here, there is no strong sink, so you don't get that um, canalisation process, or at least if you do, it's driving into this um, lateral tissue which is, um, and is therefore not connecting up to the existing strand. This is an incredibly similar position to what's going on in those stems I showed you with a bud on the side and auxin coming down from the top 
and it's able to inhibit the activity of this, of this, which you can now think of conceptually as an axillary bud. So supposing if you're an axillary bud and forming a vascular connection to the main stem through this auxin export process is a key thing to get you going, then if there's lots of auxin in the main stem, maybe you can't do that. So that's our hypothesis that um, bud activation actually requires export of auxin in a canalised stream out of the bud. There's lots of data that correlates with that. So an active bud, we can see, has polarised pins in its stem, whereas an inactive bud has pins, but they're not polar. And that polarisation is very early in the activation of a bud, so that's a good correlation. And so maybe then, if um, auxin transport canalisation out of the bud is necessary for the sustained bud growth, that's how indirectly auxin moving in the polar transport stream in the stem can inhibit the activity of this bud. When you chop the top of the plant, this auxin drains away, creating a strong sink for auxin in the stem and allowing the establishment of efflux from the bud into the stem. That's the hypothesis. And uh, we wanted to test that in a whole variety of ways and we did a lot of experiments, but actually critical in how we thought about this was computational modelling just to help us understand whether this could work. Here's the auxin source, here's the auxin sink, and then positive feedback between auxin flux and pin polarisation uh, could allow canalisation out into the stem or not, depending both on the source strength here or on the sink strength here, or on the way this positive feedback worked. So um, to, to explore that in a computational um, model, we formed a collaboration with Jemek Pushinkiewicz at the University of Calgary. And he, uh, he was very uh, well known for working in a particular computing uh, um, uh, language, effectively called L systems, a grammar that allows you um, to, it's a rewrite grammar. So it works like a plant in a very modular way. So it's very easy to model uh, uh, plant growth using an uh, L systems approach. And so um, what we did, we have, we, we, we kind of modelled the stem as, as kind of giant cells like this, a kind of giant chunk of stem with an auxin concentration here and an amount of pin protein here in the bottom and a lateral bud in the same way with uh, a auxin concentration and amount of pin. And then these white bars represent the amount of auxin moving from here to here, the flux. And the uh, maths underpinning it effectively is, is, you know, I know some people think maths is scary. This is mega simple. So all it says is that the change in pin protein, so how much pin protein there is here in be, um, being put or, or added or taken away from this membrane is equal to uh, an insertion constant, so the amount going in, um, minus uh, a, a decay constant, so the amount that just um, decays, um, and therefore the amount coming out. So the, amount of the change in pin in the membrane is the amount going in, take away the amount coming out. That is not very difficult. Um, <coughs> the interesting part is this part here. So this is a basal insertion concentration, and this insertion is proportional to the flux. So that says that um, if you've got some auxin here and a passive flux from here to here, so that's this white bar, that will drive the insertion of pin into this membrane. Now, of course, that will create more flux, which will drive more pin into the membrane and so on and so forth. So we'll drive that positive feedback canalisation process if there's enough flux going from here to here so that this flux, this um, uh, adds pin to the membrane faster than pins coming out just through this standard decay. So it's a, it's a very um, simple situation that results in two stable outcomes. So if you just plot um, the, the, the change in flux against the flux, there are two stable outcomes, and one is stably off, um, where you're stuck in the situation where there isn't enough flux, um, to drive enough pin into the membrane to overcome the amount that's decaying, um, or stably on, where you've overcome that threshold, there's now enough pin going in to overcome the amount that's coming out by decay, and because the more pin you put in, the more flux you get, that drives you across here to this stably on state. So you can have high flux, um, stably on, uh, low flux, stably off. That's, those are the choices. And through that switch, you can generate a, a situation 
<coughs> where um, you can really model that same phenomenon that I showed you at the beginning, where you see a basipetal sequence of bud activation that stops at some point. And um, all you do is build a plant out of those phytomers, adding themselves successively, with those rules for auxin behaviour, and one more rule, which is that when flowering happens, the amount of auxin being produced by our model shoot apex here drops. So here is this thing running. Here's, here's the modelled root, the ultimate sink for all auxin. And um, we're adding these uh, phytomers each time, and they're adding a, a, a lateral shoot. The, the leaf of the phytomer is not explicitly modelled. This is the lateral shoot. And what you'll see is that this lateral shoot is added at a time when there's already lots of auxin here in the main shoot. And so there isn't enough um, efflux from here to here so this white line is small, to trigger this bud to be able to establish up canalised auxin transport out into the main stem. If we wait till flowering, here's flowering, and then this blood, um, shoot stops making auxin, or at least makes very much less, what happens is the main stem depletes. It depletes low enough to allow this bud to get going on starting auxin export. And so you see this basipetal relay where the buds take it in turns to export auxin into the stem. And <coughs> in this particular simulation, this will go on forever because the amount of auxin being produced by these, um, these floral shoots is not enough ever to accumulate enough to inhibit this, this, uh, um, the next one um, uh, by uh, preventing flux from here to here that's sufficient to trigger the, the feedback. So we can reproduce this phenomenon very well. It, it makes a lot of sense in the terms of, of the, the, the vegetative Arabidopsis that makes a, a rosette of plants because in this vegetative state, there's lots of leaves being made. The leaves are a very high source for auxin. So there's a huge amount of auxin coming out of this apex, going into a very short stem. So um, no buds activated typically. As soon as you flower, um, you've got this rapid stem elongation, so now a very long stem, and um, the flowers, at least temporarily, until they start making seeds, make very little auxin, and so you've got, very, you've got much less auxin feeding into much more stem, and that's what triggers this basipetal sequence that I just showed you. And it will stop at some point, and that point will be the point at which the auxin contribution from these active shoots is enough to um, create a high, auxin, high enough auxin level in the stem to stop this bud from activating. And it turns out that in this low nitrogen situation we've measured, and the amount of auxin made, the residual auxin made by each of these shoots, turns out to be higher. And so that is one reason why stopping um, happens earlier in this low nitrogen situation. <coughs> and this is one of the things that really convinced us that this idea might be, might be true. It might be the case that um, uh, um, the way that this distributed decision-making works in, in the plant is through those extraordinary self-organising properties of the auxin transport network. And <coughs> it, it, it really appeals to me, this idea of competitive canalisation as a signal integrator, because it has these really important properties that it's all about, it's, all, it's, it's entirely relative is about which bud can export the most auxin, not how much auxin that you can export. And that gives you that um, extraordinary stability um, in, in, uh, in the context of, of um, all kinds of environmental challenges that a plant might have. And it involves these um, continuous uh, processes, so you're continuously live, you can change your mind, but you can reach these very steady, stable states, and you can integrate systemic information as well as local information, because systemically, for example, you could change the canalisation dynamics in this feedback loop. And in fact, it was ob observation of this process going on through the action of a second hormone that I will very briefly mention in the next few slides that really convinced me that this is what is going on in plants. So um, I've told you already that this auxin source strength can be affected by nitrogen availability um, because it seems to affect how much auxin is made by those um, shoots. But it turns out also that nitrogen availability affects this um, feedback loop uh, through the activity of a second hormone 
called strigalactone that was discovered using that same genetic process that I've emphasized is so um, useful um, throughout. And so we identified a bunch of mutants that are very bushy, and they're very bushy on high nitrogen and low nitrogen. And um, uh, to cut a very long story short, it turns out that they either can't make or can't sense stri um, this compound strigalactone. This, this particular mutant called MAX1 um, can't make strigalactone. And as a result, it's very, very branchy, and um, it, it is very, very branchy even on low N. This in itself is a really important result because it tells you that um, what's going on here is that this plant is not nearly as branchy as it could be. It's not resource limited. And this plant is also not nearly as branchy as it could be. It's not, it's not that this plant is just not making branches because it hasn't got enough nitrogen. It's decided instead to invest in roots, which we also know, um, um, because if you're lacking nitrogen, any, any um, that you do have, much more sensible to put in the roots where you'll be able to find more. So strigalactone, it turns out, um, works by tuning that feedback in pins. So strigalactone deficient mutants overaccumulate pins. Um, if you have a normal plant and you add a synthetic strigalactone, the pins are taken off the plant. That's true of this biosynthetic mutant that I described just on the last slide. Pins come off the membrane when you add strigalactone. But if you have a mutant that can't see strigalactone, it's insensitive to it because its signaling pathway is broken, then it overaccumulates pin proteins and it can't do anything when you give it the pin proteins. So effectively, what strigalactone is doing is driving pin off the membrane. So you can model it as this pin decay constant. And if you do that, um, just changing that one constant, reducing the amount of pin that comes off membranes, um, gives you this situation where you overaccumulate pin proteins. You actually overaccumulate auxin because every bud can export more auxin because it's got more pin proteins, so it makes more auxin. And you wind up with this constitutively very bushy plant with lots of pin proteins and lots of auxin. And that's exactly what happens uh, in, in the... the um, mutants that I've shown you. And effectively what's happened, if you think about this graph again, is by um, uh, increasing this, you've just lifted the whole thing up. So there is now no longer a stable um, uh, off. Essentially any bud will activate. The strigalactone mutant buds are, are on a kind of hair trigger. They will always activate because that canalization process will always happen because there isn't enough pin removal from the membrane um, to allow the, the things to stay stably off. So effectively, um, it's this canalization process that strigalactone is influencing. And um, as I said, turns out strigalactones are a very powerful um, nutrient deprivation signal that are made in the roots when, the, when there isn't enough um, nitrogen or phosphorus available. So <laughs> effectively, what's going on then is um, every single shoot tip in a big plant like this is exporting auxin. The auxin is being transported down the plant, and it's a signal for how happy your shoot is. Whereas strigalactone is predominantly made in roots and it is um, being transported up the plant and it is predominantly a signal for how much nutrient you have available. And those two things interacting are mediating the level of competition there is between all of these buds to export auxin down the main stem into the root. It's, it's a, um, in my new life, a lot of what I do <laughs> is run, run an organisation that gives out grant funding. Um, to, to researchers. And um, that grant funding, the way it works is you put your grant into the, to the committee. The committee sit round and they rank all the grants according to how good they think they are. And then they say, oh, Otterline, what is the budget? And I say, oh, it's this. And they draw a line and that cutoff is, uh, is above, the, above the line, you get the money, below the line you don't because the money's run out. That's what strigalactone does. Strigalactone is the grant budget. <laughs> it doesn't rank the grants. Um, that's done by um, the auxin export effectively, by how happy the shoe tapex is and how much auxin it's, is being transported. But it does tell you how many buds can activate overall. Um, it's, it's, it's the budget. So <laughs> interestingly enough, if we go back to this comparison with, with animals and behaviour, what's going on in a plant is competition with reinforcement in the auxin transport network to make these behavioural decisions. What's going on in an animal in your brain is competition with reinforcement, rewiring your neurons 
um, in response to learning. So the, the engineering principle, the design principle for making the decision is actually remarkably similar. It's just mediated in a very different way in the two different organisms. So last um, uh, few slides, if I'm allowed, because I know I'm running out of time, um, is just to kind of summarise that and, and say how I got from that into my current job. <laughs> so essentially what's going on is um, these multi-scale systems. So uh, you can think of a cell as a dynamic self-organising system of interacting molecules. And inside the cell, these are the molecules interacting. And then you can think of a tissue, or in this case a meristem, as a dynamic self-organising system of interacting cells. And then you can think of a plant as a dynamic self-interacting system of interacting, self-organising system of interacting meristem. So this is exactly the kind of multi-scale information transfer that allows you to go from those tiny DNA level changes up to the big whole plant changes. And you can learn about that so powerfully through just studying those mutants and understanding what they do. I, as you might tell, I hope you can tell, I really enjoyed doing this work. It's so exciting to have the opportunity to figure out these extraordinary things going on. And whilst I've been doing this, the whole science system in the UK has been growing. It's fantastic. Our opportunities have been growing and growing because of the new tools we have available. Uh, and that grant competition process is becoming more and more fierce. And the way we decide who the winners are, I think, has become more and more stupid. <laughs> and those series of events, I think, have made it much less fun than it used to be. And I got more and more frustrated about that. And I've worked for many years to do various things to try to make it more fun again, um, like the Sainsbury Lab, which is incredibly fun, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, learning from that, I thought, OK, this is possible. Why don't we shift science policy na nationally, if at all possible, to make it more fun for everybody? And... <laughs> If you compare um, uh, to the plant, you can think of um, science is done by um, uh, in research institutes and departments around the country, and these are dynamic self-organising systems of interacting groups. And um, then the departments or institutions uh, uh, um, form universities, and they, these are dynamic self-organising systems of interacting departments. And then across the country, so it's the same thing. The same logic, it completely applies. And so exactly the same uh, um, way of thinking about how plants work, how, you, how vegetables think. <laughs> you can take that way of thinking to use that to try to understand the research and innovation system and figure out um, how you might tune that, what, what the hormones are, what, what's the stragalactone for research and innovation that I can um, regulate more um, effectively um, who gets to grow, <laughs> or um, maybe that's, a, that's not quite the, the analogy I'm looking for, but nonetheless, um, how can we understand this system and the interactions between it and the incentives we put in place um, to make it um, more vibrant, more exciting, more creative, more productive? So I moved uh, two years ago to head up UK Research and Innovation. We are the largest public sector of fu funder of research and innovation in the UK. We spend £8 billion a year, that's a lot of money, on research and innovation across the UK. Um, and we, the, the real opportunity from UK Research and Innovation is the fact that we have brought together, um, it's, it's a relatively new organisation, it's four and a half years old, and it has brought together nine pre-existing organisations and those are the nine different research councils that fund um, different disciplines. So if you're a plant person, you're mostly interested in the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. But we've got the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research. We've got all of them. <laughs> and we also have an organisation called Innovate UK that's the UK's innovation agency that funds full businesses and Research England that puts block grants into English universities working um, very closely with the equivalent bodies in the devolved administrations that put them into Scottish and Northern Irish and Welsh universities. So we've got access to everything. And we can work with everybody, hopefully to create uh, this uh, uh, you know, really vibrant, dynamic system that really gives everybody the opportunity to, to participate and to benefit. That's my, my kind of um, uh, goal in, in taking this on. And I, I'll skip over that. We, we, we spend money on lots of different things. £8 billion pounds sounds like a lot, but it's amazing how quickly it goes. So it's about 10% um, altogether on studentships and fellowships, 
about 20% on those grant processes I talked about, uh, a lot into those block grants into universities, 10% order into infrastructure and research institutes. Some of the really fantastic research institutes around the country are just directly supported by us. Some um, more, um, I mean, they're, they're actually part of us and some are just um, funded by us. Um, the John Innes Institute that you may have heard of that gets a lot of money through us. And then there's a lot of innovation-led funding of various sorts and um, international collaboration. And, and at the moment, we're funding a lot of COVID research, obviously. And um, so the, this, is, this is my goal. This is the point, and I just just this slide can be can be the last slide. I'm really keen that we shift the system and we shift it through these four principles for change. We need diversity. We need to think: Are we investing in the full range of things that we need? The right balance of people and ideas and infrastructures and institutions and all the rest of it. Not can everybody compete on the same criteria, but do we have the criteria right so we get out the right mix of everything? And that absolutely includes the diversity of people and diversity of skills and um, types of project, types of idea, all of this diversity, absolutely fundamental to making this work. That only works if it's properly joined up. So diversity with connectivity is crucial. And then we need to worry about resilience. We've seen in COVID how um, potentially unstable things are. And none of it works unless all of this is deeply engaged with the many stakeholders who need to care about this stuff. The wider public, policymakers, everybody, because this research innovation is really the only way we're going to build a long-term prosperous economy where everybody um, is benefiting and everybody feels that they can participate. So that, that's my kind of um, hopelessly idealistic vision for where we're going. <laughs> and I am um, doing my best to make that happen through thinking about all of those different things. And to me, as I say, it does all come back to this multi-scale thinking, how small changes at this scale have big changes, impacts at that scale. And that, I think, is another crucial message. However big and scary it looks, however much you look, it looks to you as though you're at the mercy of some huge system, you as an individual in that system do have power. And I think it's really a, uh, an opportunity for everybody to take the power that they have, however small it might be, and use it because everybody acting together can really drive change. And you, um, you know, one of the reasons I love speaking at this meeting is that you are that next generation. You are the people who are going to be able to embed that change um, going forward. And so um, thank you. Um, and um, yeah, happy to take any questions if anyone can be bothered to wait any longer because the pub quiz beckons. Mm -hmm. <laughs>